and yada and dada to you all. Welcome to Pure Finds, the podcast where four awesome guys talk about four awesome albums. Today we are three awesome guys talking about three awesome albums. I'm Chris Morrison. I'm Ian. I'm Kyle. Yeah, excellent. We got a great show for you lined up today. Uh, we're going all the way from 1973 all the way up to 1989. Uh, we have great albums to talk about. Um, Ian's first, but before that, we got some fun stuff to talk about. We put out the question to everybody that... Uh, what songs do you think made a, mu- a movie scene? And we we gave our suggestions last episode. I was a little behind, but I have gotten so many more now to make up for that. I do. I oh, have, you have a lot now? I have, I have two to make up for. He, he couldn't make his, up his mind. I still <laughs> couldn't. I'm so indecisive. I'm a horrible voter. I, I don't even vote. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's how bad I am. <laughs> Uh, my my choices that I w- did find out, uh, I just wanted to mention quickly. Uh, Deadpool, the opening scene. Okay, yeah. yeah I didn't even board. think yeah. of that. Yeah, I was like, that made that shit. It was fucking hilarious. I laughed my ass off. And then Tusk, uh, the Ooh. Kevin Smith movie, when um, Michael Parks and uh, Justin Long are in the walrus suits. You really were put on the spot uh-huh. last week. You yeah, didn't know what was going on. <laughs> I was like, yeah, like then they were in the walrus costumes fighting while the Fleetwood Matt song, yeah. Tusk, was You're, playing. Which is a great song. Yeah, it was a really great to scene, it. too. It made the movie. I loved that movie. Yeah. Um, he would say other Kevin Smith would say otherwise. He hate he, well, he doesn't hate mm. it, but he doesn't take it as one of his best. Uh, also, Reservoir Dogs, um, stuck in the middle with you. Oh yeah, yeah, great that's, scene. That's those are just a few because I was like I I, dro- I totally dropped the ball last <laughs> week, Kyle. You weren't uh, here. Like, it was bad. Yeah, it was bad. I was, I was like, oh no, I got this. Like I've watched so many movies. I'm good. I got Quite it. Literally, I didn't him even on think the spot, about, and he didn't know what to do. Yeah. I didn't <laughs> think about it the whole time, and then it's like it came, it came to the, the end. It, it came to the end, and it was kind of like, so what? So what do we think are ours? The I was like, oh start fuck. I, yeah, I, like, I have not thought of one. Oh damn. Yeah. But you put and, me on the spot, and I was just like coming up with some shitty ones. So I'm uh, glad, I'm no, glad actually, I, <laughs> I just asked you, Kyle. <laughs> and say I have it, the proof. Say it. It is Trisha Yearwood song. Uh, what was it? How do I live? Yeah. From Con Air. Con Air, dude. The beginning and the ending. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a. I don't know. I think it's an awesomely bad movie. You know oh, what I yeah. mean? If I could say that, you know, you you enjoy watching it, but it's not like something that you uh, you criticize too much because it's like it's like yeah but it, it's it kind of makes yeah. the scene it's a very beautiful song it we, is a great we, song. we listened to yeah. it before we started recording just to kind of refresh our memories on exactly what the song was and yeah we were crying <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. tears were shed yeah. we got into a into a mood yeah, we uh <laughs> we were singing all off key <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no! the <laughs> Get, getting ourselves ready for yeah. this podcast Heck yeah it, but it was so much fun it was I, magical I, what about uh what about you know take it to the limit or push it to the limit by uh What's his name? And Scarface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Grand Theft Auto 3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My favorite video yeah, game. Yeah, Scarface, push time. it to the limit. Yeah. The whole montage of him coming to power. and Yeah. It's like that. that's super. That's all I could come up with. Yeah, guys. but I'm still that was better <laughs> off the ball than what I had because uh-huh. I was like Titanic. Like just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> off the top of my the damn Titanic, head. My Uncle Jacob would be very proud of you, though. He's, yeah, a, right. he's a huge Celine Dion fan. Oh, Uncle Jacob. Yeah. All right. Well, I do want to get around to what everybody on Facebook said because I put the question out to you, the public, and you responded very well, and I loved your answers, and I was berating myself all week because I was like, I couldn't come up with one, then everybody comes up with all these great suggestions, <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, I thought about <laughs> half of those. I was like, that was really good. Okay, so I'm going to get down to everybody who's way better at p- pinpointing this shit than I am. Okay, I'm going to start off with our friend Travis. He wrote in, he said, Hip to be Square by Huey Lewis in the News in American Psycho. Wow! Yeah. Hey, Paul! <laughs> yeah, and he hits him with the fucking axe. Yes, I was like friends up north that, that love that movie. Yeah, it's yeah, like I loved it stuff. too. That's why I was like, he mentioned. I was like, oh <laughs> shit! Like, you got me. Damn, that was good. Yeah. Like Travis, word up, man. Good for you. Uh, our friend Gustavo says Wayne's World, Bohemian Rhapsody. Hello. Wow. Like, yeah. We that's, think about wow. That? Yeah, that's a great scene. That's a really good scene. Yeah, yeah. I made it. It's and it was like that was a great suggestion too. Where I was like. I can't believe I didn't think of that. But I'm not going to say that after every single one now. <laughs> Our friend John says, Kenny Rogers in the first edition just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. <laughs> you know where it's going. Yes. Big Lebowski, gutter balls sequence. It's great. Yep, yep. And uh, let's see. And he also says, the score to Platoon will when William Def- when Willem Dafoe is killed. That do, 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 do. He's getting shot oh, yeah, in the woods. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, the chopper's leaving, and he's like the last straggler. Oh, man. Um, 
what is that? I forgot. Oh, does that it have a name? Yeah, uh, I'm just I'm trying to remember it because I, I actually I heard that on classical radio before I lost my license. I'd drive around listening to classical radio because the rest of the radio I've heard all about. But um, yeah, man, I I I'm drawing a, bl a complete yeah. blank right now. It was. It was He's a great uh, a composer. I just can't remember his name. Maybe I'll remember it later. <laughs> John <laughs> you know. Williams? John, yeah, well, <laughs> the default is John Williams. If that is incorrect, please correct us in yeah. the comments on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on, our friend Christian says, Where is my mind by the Pixies in Fight Club? Uh, did not look it up. I didn't pinpoint it, but I'm going to tonight. If anybody out there knows exactly what we're talking about, give a good hoorah <laughs> <laughs> and please comment or just give a thumbs up to Christian. Uh, but, um, let me see here. Moving on. And this this one, uh, I think Ian will definitely, uh, you're going to like this one. They just put a picture and I got it. Okay. Le our friend Lyric House says, Scotty doesn't know Euro Trip. Yes. yes. <laughs> I was like, I say that smile creep across your face. <laughs> Scotty doesn't know, Scotty. That's when every all the high schoolers are graduating and they're throughout the entire freaking movie. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and the song keeps reappearing about uh, the song about how the lead singer is cheating on the main character's girlfriend and everything. <laughs> so and good. The song just keeps coming up. And it's like good, good pull, Lyric House. Great pull. A uh, friend, Liza. I think I'm saying that right now because I pronounced it Liza forever ago. Liza, I hope, <laughs> wrote back. Uh, she says, Reservoir Dogs, Little Green Bag. Yep, and yeah. that's uh, by the George uh, the George Baker selection. Is that correct? Hey, yeah. uh, you got me, man. I, I just know the song because of the <laughs> movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when they're all walking down the stuff. street and shit. Yeah, right on. A lot, of good, a lot of good tunes. Tarantino, that was the one thing I give him credit for is his uh, choice of music and oh, yeah. film. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, last time I was like Django Unchained, 100 Black Coffins. That's yeah. what I said. Because <laughs> I couldn't come up with anything. <laughs> um, our friend Jesse writes in and he says, Sunshine of Your Love and Goodfellas. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good yeah, yeah, Robert that, De Niro. Yeah, that smoking. zoom in scene. Yeah, yeah that stuff. was tight. Like, I, I just checked it out the other day because, I, like I said, I watched the movie. I just didn't catch it before. Mm -hmm. This time I did, I was watching it. I was like, dang, that's pretty intense. Yeah. <laughs> it was cool. Cool scene. And he also wrote in uh, Ride of the Valkyries, Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Hello. The helicopter yeah. scene. Yeah. They're all just coming over. It's classic. As they're blowing up the village. Yeah. It's I feel absolutely like, classic. I feel now. like uh, that movie definitely did Robert Duvall justice, you know, because oh, a, yeah. a lot of the films he was in, um, I mean, he's still playing a supporting role, not to get onto a movie discussion or anything, but I really do like the uh, theatrical version of that film, and I feel like mm -hmm. that is yeah. that, that song kind of coincides with that man's face, <laughs> you know, yeah. for that movie. So, but yeah, there's a lot of good picks, man. I'm impressed. Yeah, <laughs> it's like uh, our listeners are cultured. Yeah. You know, they're, they're smart people. We got the greatest listeners. <laughs> yeah, that's like, world. I'm not, like, I would, and I'm not just some guy. Like, we, you know, we expect no less. Yeah, yeah. it's like I, I, I expected, like, put the question out, you know, get a couple of, like, you know, Titanic and stuff like that. So, <laughs> and I was like, no, actually, everybody knocked it out of the goddamn park. They, yeah. they had great picks. Some, some Chris happy. Morrison deer in the headlights moments. Yeah, <laughs> deer in the headlights. I cannot be caught off guard, or I'm like, yeah, deer caught in the uh, headlights. <laughs> 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 or a cow, whatever. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not judging. Oh, our friend John also wrote in as a postscript. Uh, he mentioned it today after polls were closed, but okay. I, I didn't <laughs> want to throw it out there. He also mentioned uh, the the movie The Lost Boys. People are strange. Oh yeah, for the opening. yeah. I haven't seen that movie nice. since like '98. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've never I've never not, seen the film, but I checked out the scene after time. I saw he wrote it in, and I was like, I was like, okay, let me check this out. I was like, good pull. That's a really cool <laughs> opener. I like that song too because I just did the Doors last week. L.A. Woman. There's a funny connection between The Lost Boys and Reservoir Dogs when uh, oh? Tim Roth is going on making up his big huge speech to to tell the uh, the group of guys that he's... Because, he, you know, not to ruin it for anyone, but if you haven't seen the movie, God damn it. Like, it's been long enough. Yeah, Spoilers but, are closed. <laughs> that is done, dude. But, you know, Tim Roth is the cop, and he's he's remembering and reciting a anecdote to tell all of these... To, to tell all the people that he's working with to convince them that he's one of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he mentions, I'm trying to watch the fucking Lost Boys and I'm and I'm getting over here, you know, people <laughs> wanting to buy weed off me. I, you know, and I like them. They're my friends and all, you know. Yeah. Kind of paraphrasing what he's saying. Nice. But, wow. but yeah, he mentions that and I thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, we got some some connection there. Maybe I'm just a little far out right now. But <laughs> <laughs> 
No, no, I feel you, man. That's cool. The preconceived janks. That was, like when you just said that, he kind of goes through a preconceived spiel to get people to think yeah. he's like them. That reminds me of "There Will Be Blood" with um, was it Daniel Day Lewis's awesome speech that he gives everybody when he wants to go to their town and drill full oil. But all that aside, back to the music. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> now we're getting out of cinematography and into <laughs> the sexy world of record engineering. Mm. Music? You mean music? Music? Just the albums? Just the albums of music. Yeah. All right, uh, like I said, we're going from 1973 all the way up to 89, so this is a good span of music that we're going to be hearing about today. Uh, Ian is starting us off, and what is your what is your pick for this week, man? I am taking it back sometime from my last two. Okay, yeah, because yeah. you were going more modern the past <laughs> yeah, two. Yeah, I did go yeah. modern for the last two, 2014 and 2006, I believe. I think it was 2000 and... Yeah. 2006? Yeah, 2006. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no, you did 2004 and then 2014, I think. Because uh, you did Congos. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you, you did you the Sound yeah. Clash. Oh, yeah. I was about to say, you wouldn't even... Better, I, win, I, better win Sound Clash, because oh. I looked it up afterwards. Okay, oh. you proved <laughs> me wrong. What'd oh. you think? Uh, it was pretty all right, man. I, I, I could dig it. Like I listened to it when I was at work all day. And oh, nice. I was like, dang, man, these guys can play. It was pretty inspiring. I think it didn't uh, go with, uh, was it, what was the album? Um, Sounding Mosaics, was it? Or, Sounding the Mosaic. Yeah, Sounding a Mosaic. And I don't think the uh, playlist I was listening to kept to the album itself. Okay. But there were a couple in there where I would look at it. Good, good then, cut from uh, Rollins' band. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love my Rollins' Had band. to take a break. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit here. Considering my last two, I'm doing Band on the Run by Paul McCartney and the Wings. Yeah, Band on the Run. Yeah. <laughs> One of the singles released, of oh, course. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was released in the U.S. In, on December 5th, 1973, and released in the U.K. on the 7th of the same year. Uh, it's their stu- third studio album, fifth one that uh, Paul McCartney has done since breaking up the Beatles. Okay, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I forget. I yeah, I'm not not the album that I'm doing. I forgot which one that it was, but yeah, I, a lot of interesting things happened during this album, and I mean, they mm-hmm. recorded at they recorded at several. <laughs> they just huh. jumped around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like I'm sitting here looking at my notes, and it's it's not as you know neat as it usually is and it's kind of hodgepodge all around because it's like i'd keep reading and reading and reading and reading and it's like oh this would go great here and that would go yeah, great here and yeah, it's like uh-huh. wait they recorded here too <laughs> serious oh god damn it i, I gotta go move, this. I like, move this yeah yeah everything. yeah like i try to write it out it's like a script almost that's what then. that's what if people at home don't know it's like podcasting it does take notes <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, we we do bit, write down notes sometimes yeah it's like take us a bit of notes you but just yeah, gotta have organized. <laughs> there there are three different studios that they recorded at there was a uh, EMI studios in Lagos Nigeria ooh yeah the the Exotic. thing behind yeah the thing behind that it was exactly that is that Paul McCartney for this album wanted to record somewhere exotic to get more of a you know inspiration i guess you could say for the album right on which at the time none of the music on this album really reflects that solid that area solidly but i mean (laughs) in a way i guess you could say but yeah they recorded at three different studios there's emi studios in lagos uh lagos nigeria there's arc studio and I didn't look up where this one was at, but the thing behind that was um, Ginger Baker from Cream. Oh. Bass player from Cream. Mm-hmm. Actually invited Paul McCartney to his studio, Arc Studios, to record some of the album. And what hey. ended up happening was that he, uh, Paul McCartney didn't really want to go. <laughs> I was like, I'll see what yeah. I'm doing. <laughs> but they, he went and um, he ended up recording a song there. And the contribution that Ginger Breaker made to that song was gravel in a tin can as a shaker. <laughs> and that's it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't write down the song only because it was like it's not one of the major ones on the album. Still good. But it's just like right. a B-side. Yeah. Yeah. Basically a B-side. But I didn't 
you know, it was like, it's not important. The fact that Ginger Baker invited Paul McCartney to record something and like, ended up with a tin shaker full of gravel. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like, if that's all you can offer, like, you come all the way to my studio, and that, like, or I came to your studio, and all you can offer me is a gravel shaker. Like, well, I mean, yeah. I, I kind of think of it as uh, a little bit open mind, you know, kind of like that's John definitely, Lennon, maybe. You it's know? definitely like open Lennon's kind of nuts and will take anything and make it. And, Make yeah, something out of it. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. It's just I thought it but, was funny that like Paul McCartney was like, oh, I don't really want to do it. Well, I find it interesting now after learning, you know, him jumping around like you said. Mm. The title of the the song being a band on the run. They're they're running around recording at all these different studios. It was actually like, a re- uh, uh, in reference to a George Harrison quote. Oh, while man. they were the Beatles, uh, you know, George Harrison explaining that they were a band on the run at times, you know, <laughs> Beatlemania yeah. and such. And, oh, yeah. 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 And that it, it kind of flooded into the album itself. And uh, the concept behind it was like trying to escape and running. And, you know, Isn't that's, that like the plot of Hard Day's Night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, but I mean, when you think about <laughs> this being recorded <laughs> sometime later. You know, that was the whole concept behind the album was, you know, running and uh, trying to escape and that sort of thing. But, yeah, like I said, it recorded in three different studios at different times between, uh, let's see here, August and October of 1973. So in a few times, a couple of months, you know, three three months, months, they're all over the place. You know, the, (laughs) the rehearsals started, obviously, before they left in... Scotland at the Paul, at the McCartney's farm. Oh, cool! And all of them together: uh, Paul McCartney, Linda McCartney, Paul McCartney's wife at the time, uh, Denny Lane, who is an ex Moody Blues player, Hen- Henry McCulloch, Culloch, Culloch, McCulloch, McCulloch, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, Denny Sewell. Yeah, the five of them went out to the Paul McCartney's farm in Scotland to start rehearsals. Paul McCartney and Henry McCulloch actually got into it while they were there Mm -hmm. and left a week before they started, went to Lagos, Nigeria to record, along with Denny Sewell. So two of their members, a guitar player and a a drummer, gone from the band, left the band before they started. Yeah, left. Wow. They're just like, fuck you, I'm out. So... Wow, it's hey. called throwing a wrench in things. You do that to somebody that's not that famous and you're you're pretty screwed. (laughs) Yeah, so they left due to dispute and all that stuff. The other three, Denny Lane, Linda McCartney, Paul McCartney, still ended up going to Legos to record. Yeah, just march on without him. I mean, they recorded most of everything. They used Paul McFucking McCartney. Yeah. He do whatever he wants. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you have. Hey, what's this? A drum kit? Okay. Uh, let me see. Bum, bum, Seriously. Bum, so you have yeah, Paul. Like Neil Peart. <laughs> you have Paul and Denny, Denny Lane recording basically everything for the album, along with uh, Linda and whatnot. And the sheer you know, artistry of those two to be able to do all of it. I mean, of course, it's a Paul McCartney. But well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you say Paul McCartney and it's like, oh, okay. He is, he is a man of many hats. He yeah. Is very, he's a, he is a musician and an artist. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so, I mean... And now a professor. <laughs> yeah. Really? A professor of music. Uh, what was it? Not Harvard. It's not oh, a man. law school, but it was like one of these big name schools up north. He's was... Uh, yeah, Actually pointed up. Uh, yeah, he's a. Well, I mean, I don't know if he goes there or not. I don't. I don't know his. Yeah, you know what yeah. he. What is life? It's Paul like McCartney. That. But yeah, they <laughs> they uh, they would let him if he wanted to do lectures there. Yes, he is Sir Doctor Paul McCartney. He is a. Has a Sir Doctor. Yeah, it's, it's not real. Sir Paul McCartney PhD. It's Sir Doctor. Yeah, well, that's what I. That's what I would Doctor say. Doctor yeah. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'd say the Sir comes before the Doctor. Oh yeah. I mean, in timeline. Oh, yeah. I, I <laughs> But uh, yeah, so they end up going to Nigeria at this EMI studio there. And when they get there, they come to find out that it is in shambles. I mean, this recording studio is bad. Just things aren't working correctly. Uh, it only had an A-track recording studio or recorder at that time, which by that time ni- in the 1970s, you know, everybody had basically upgraded to 16 or I can't. Do not quote me on this. I don't think 24 was out yet. And um, that basically just wasn't happening. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's just bad studio experience, but they made the best of it. They still recorded most of the stuff there. Um, they basically turned it into like a, a vacation, basically, where they spent the weekdays recording and the weekends they were tourists. Yeah. Uh, I mean, while <laughs> they were... to be. Yeah, huh. while, while they were there... 
uh, Paul McCartney joined a country club for a short time. <laughs> you know, they they played the Sad tourist point. aspect, and yeah. as in, not necessarily saying in foreign countries bad things happen to foreigners, but uh, while they were there, Paul and Linda were actually robbed at knife point. What? <laughs> and the the thing that He's on Earth though, right? Yeah, John, John right. Lennon. <laughs> and where's the, John when you need him? <laughs> yeah. And the thing that kind of like gets to me is that the the other than you know the personal effects, you know the money and stuff like that being stolen, there was also a uh, you know a notebook full of lyrics and songs and oh. many cassette tapes of demo songs stolen. Oh, well, at least shit. the robber knew what the fuck to take, huh? Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I think it was a, a, a situation in which he just took everything. Yeah. He just you know, it's it. like, oh, there's a bag full of stuff. I don't know what's in it. I'm going to take it anyways. Yeah. And that's the horrible. Wow. Like, even when he finds out, like, what kind of stuff that is, like, you can't sell it or be like, oh, this is going to auction because they'll be like, it was you. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, of course it can trace back. And right. Paul McCartney be like, oh, I'm going to book she is <laughs> now, mate. <laughs> But yeah, like that's the kind of thing. Like, what was in that book? What could have been in that book? What were the demos? What could we may have heard. Out of yeah, that? to Paul yeah. McCartney, just get this thing where it's like, oh, stolen. I will never play it again or write it. That's like, all I done. found of it was that it was stolen. I don't know if anything became of it or if you know, like most of us have ideas in the back of our head if they were still there to you know that kind of thing. I don't know. Hey, everybody on planet Earth, keep a lookout at flea markets. If you see something <laughs> that says Paul McCartney Wings demo, <laughs> uh, you should definitely buy it because whoever's selling it probably thinks, yeah, it's nothing, but it could be stolen property, <laughs> which is worth way more. <laughs> report to the local authorities if yeah, you have right. any information. <laughs> no. <laughs> just Don't like, report just it. Kidding. Sell it to me. <laughs> it, it's funny because, you know, it's, it is a fantastic album, but while they were there in Nigeria, just all this random shit happens. Just like, Recording on the weekdays, tourists on the weekend, being robbed at knife point. <laughs> Not only that, but there was uh, an issue with a local Afrobeat star <laughs> named, Afro star. and I'm probably going to pronounce this horribly, but Go for it, it. Fila, Fila Kuti, Fila Kuti, Fila Kuti. Anyway, <laughs> he accused Paul McCartney of basically <laughs> coming to Africa to exploit and steal African music. What? Yeah. And so, like, Ouch. what ended up happening is the guy ended up, because I guess they had visited a club of his and, mm -hmm. you know, don't steal my music. Yeah. This is our, you know, well, legacy. So, like they, they, they came over as tourists, and he kind of looked at it as like, you're stepping on my turf now. Well, I mean, well, it, was, it wasn't... The Illuminati, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't in a situation of, like, coming here to steal our music. He wanted to go somewhere exotic to record, to free yeah. his mind, to do that thing. And I guess at this club that this guy owned or whatnot, you know, when they went, he assumed that they were stealing African culture and the music and oh, stuff like wow. that. So he confronted Paul McCartney and the band and stuff like that at the studio that they were recording in, Ooh. you know, Ooh. to bad get, form, get down to the bottom of yeah. this. And they ended up playing their songs to for him to show that it's like, this is nothing. This, wow. is, this, this is nothing that Paul like, McCartney entertained this guy. Yeah. Like, okay, listen, we're, we're not stealing your music. I mean, he is a good guy. Like, like, he <laughs> oh, entertained him with a fist to the face and a boot to the ass. It's like, out the damn door. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but I mean, it's Paul McCartney. He is a good guy in his own rights. And it's like... Yeah, gotta give it to him. That's, yeah, that's, I mean... That's very gentlemanly. Let me yeah. prove yeah. to you that we're not doing this. So here's this album that's not released yet, and we're going to play it for you live. Yeah. <laughs> and then and he then steals it. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he steals it. He steals it from him like, you dumb bloat. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's when the guy's standing... like. Everybody's hanging out in the uh, the sound booth, like where everybody has their instruments set up, playing the music, and the guy's yeah. even in there. And then once it's all done, like bling, last note. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then you hear the door lock behind the guy. He's <laughs> like, "No, empty your pockets. I just got robbed. Uh, I'll see what your culture you're is." You're getting robbed, don't you? You're getting robbed, don't you? <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're, you know, so all this stuff surrounding it while they're recording there, I guess they finally get fed up with. The fact that all it's, the craziness, yeah, <laughs> and and they make their way back to to London, and there's so many outside Beatles influences in this, and I say this because the producer slash engineer was George Emmerich, who did most of the Beatles engineering. Okay, yeah, and not only that, but when they went back to London, they had some stuff to finish up, obviously, so they finished. Mo the the overdubs and the orchestral recordings at Air Studios, which is George Martin's 
studio who George was Martin. their producer. George R. R. Martin? No, no, just George no. Martin. <laughs> who George produced Martin, the Beatles. The dude. <laughs> Genius man who produced the Beatles, uh, America, I think, some other. I, I am horribly not doing him justice right now for as much as I admire the man. Right. You know. Well, you know, what was uh, Emmerich's know. first name? George Emmerich. George, George Emmerich. Okay. Yeah. And basically, it, when they went to the studio, they transferred all the tracks from 8-track to 16. Oh, cool. So they could do the uh, orchestral arrangements and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, get everything in and uh, Basically to expand on, the, the at the time, the shitty situation of an 8-track recorder. Yeah, yeah. Even yeah, though right. years <laughs> you know earlier you <laughs> when they first came out, when the Beatles first came out and this 8-track you know, appeared on the market, they were ecstatic with it. Right. But being the 70s and the ever-evolving music industry and the equipment that goes behind it, you know, 8-track was nothing anymore. Now I want 16 tracks. Yeah. Give me 16. Now we're like freaking 148 or something like that. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but, Not yeah. even necessary. It's like direct TV almost, you know, like the channels start repeating. You don't even I need mean, some of these channels. I mean, let's see here. Unless you're... Hmm, Make un- you think a little bit here. Yeah. Unless you are Jim Morrison or the dude from the Beach Boys, you could probably use all of those 148 tracks. Mm. Jeffrey Emmerich? Yeah. G. Osprey? Is yeah, man, G. the guy was working or... at, uh, he, he was an assistant engineer at EMI at the age of yeah. 15. He, he's got a crap that ton of crazy. accolades. I, I read his book, like I said, I did him no justice, because, I mean, he's got a crap ton of accol- accolades. He's fantastic. Yeah, I was just checking him out real quick, because I was like, oh, I haven't heard much of him. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and uh, so, like I said, that they finished doing all that in London. Uh, the singles released, Jet... Mrs. Vanderbilt and Band on the Run. I mean, mm-hmm. two of those, I'm sure you both, everybody's oh, yeah. heard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic songs. I love the I, cover, the album cover. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's very, uh, that was very, I don't know whose idea that was, but that was genius. Album. Very Paul McCartney-ish. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the track list because I would recommend anybody to listen to the whole thing. Sure. Just Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, obviously, most of you have been, or if not, you're not under a rock, have heard you know, these singles, Jet and Band on the Run, especially Mrs. Yeah. Vanderbilt, maybe not. But I mean, if you are living under a rock, Jet, Band on the Run. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Move to England, move to America. You know, what are you doing in Iraq, anyways? No. <laughs> Just kidding. But yeah, some of the accolades uh, it won two Grammys. It was nominated for another one in 1975. It was nominated for, I want to say, Album of the Year. Didn't win, though. Oh, uh, okay. I wish I kind of looked up who won, but eh, wasn't really that important. Yeah, we, we're not always interested in who wins, because yeah. that's just the British critiques. That are all <laughs> yeah, I mean, on everybody. Think, <laughs> think about it this way, though. We've, we've spoken several times about how, you know, it, something will top high in the U.S. or Australia, but the U.K.'s like, fuck you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember but, being unless here it's one of them. Those. Unless it's one of them, uh, which yeah. gets to my point, it actually did top number one in the UK. Fly. Yeah. There you go. You know, he's but Sir Paul McCartney. He's, yeah, he's Sir Paul McCartney now. You know, he's yeah. he's had a little yes, pull sir. with the Queen. Dude, does he? The Majesty's a pretty nice. Do, girl. Does he, <laughs> you you went and saw Paul McCartney. I did. Did it have Sir before it on the queue? No. Very so humble. Very modest, so he's a very yeah. guy. Very yeah, he's humble, a very, very great modest. guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's just like, no, I'm Paul McCartney. And the Queen, of course, like Sir Paul McCartney. <laughs> he's just like, no, ma'am, <laughs> just Paul. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'll get that's to really nice. that. That's yeah. really another story for another time. My experience <laughs> going and watching that. I mean, it's, it's. Let me finish up the album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, <laughs> do, do, do you think we're one, cool? two <laughs> Grammys, uh, best engineered non classical album, and best pop performance by a duo or group with vocals. Hmm. Uh, like I said, charts number one U.S., U.K., and Australia. So we got the trifecta right there. Yeah. Yeah. Hats off. Um, three times platinum in the U.S. and platinum in the U.K. Yeah, platinum. They, you're good. Then it's a good album if it's going platinum in USA and UK. That's that's the winner for me. In my opinion, yeah. it's always like if you can hit both of those, you're you're fine. And and by far, the, I mean Paul McCartney's best album yet, selling wise too. I mean yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah, because yeah. I've never really listened to the whole record, but I definitely know uh, 
a good amount of his hits. I mean, the, these two to. know my my obsession. Uh, yeah, it's an obsession. <laughs> yes, <laughs> appreciation. Appreciation. <laughs> that, that's, <Sure>. a be- <laughs> that's a better. That's a better word. Know it a little bit better than me. But appreciation yeah. for Paul McCartney. And like I said, it was, uh, some years ago, I went and saw him live at FedEx Field up in Maryland. And yeah, fantastic show. Fantastic. Man, I wish I could have seen it. Baby, I'm amazed at the way oh, you it was love so me good. all the time. So freaking good. And I, I bought the, the live DVD from the New York uh, show that he did, uh-huh. uh, I guess, the week before, which a little upset because uh, Billy Joel came out and played with him at that show. What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's okay. Like yeah. I said, it's Paul McCartney. You can get over the fact that Billy Joel wasn't there. Right. I mean, yeah. That's something a lot of people don't take into consideration nowadays, too, is like, you know, the the fact that things don't necessarily need to be recorded. It doesn't yeah. need to be documented necessarily. The fact that you were there and you saw it, that, yeah. that's the sentiment. That's Absolutely. the real, that's but the real thing. Magic. But, and I but it would have been nice if fuck, Billy Joel is with yeah. him. Yeah, that would have been great. I would... Mm-hmm. Kind of and feel I mean, cheated. Like, why didn't you guys film this? You did that over there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a similar situation. Me and uh, me and my friend Joe in 2011 huh. went to DC to see Pink Roll Floyd the Wall. Walsh's. Yeah, Roger yeah. Waters doing the Wall. Pink Floyd's the Wall. And mm-hmm. It was an amazing, spectacular show. And rumors were that the uh, their original guitarist David Gilmore was going to be there and play the solo to comfortably numb on top yeah, of the wall. They did it Once in the, England, right? And yes. So they, they figured, you yeah. know, capital of America, why not? But, but we figured it would be here because it was yeah. like, we're in Washington, D.C. And 10, it's 10, 10. Yeah, it was 10, 10. Yeah, no, that's right. It was 10, uh, yeah. 2010, not 2011. Yeah, I wanted to go to that show and missed yeah. it, of course. Yeah, it was like, I went. It was a fantastic show, but it was so fucking funny because the rumors was going on and everybody was talking about outside of the uh, Verizon Center. And we're sitting there talking about it, and like, oh my god, like, we think it's gonna happen. We think it's gonna happen. It's everything's aligned. Ten, ten, ten in DC, yeah. and then uh, the wall is completed. The solo comfortably numb is starting. Like they're playing it, and the spotlight hits the top of the wall, and it's just the regular like. The audience realizes guy. that ten, ten, ten <laughs> is actually fertilizer that you get from the store, <laughs> and that it has absolutely no significance yeah. to David Gilmore. Not, nothing mm. at all. <laughs> it, it was so no, because it was so funny. As soon as that spotlight hit, and you saw that it wasn't David Gilmore, you heard like this oh over the <laughs> <laughs> amongst cheers and applause. The sigh. Like, oh. <laughs> I was just, I was like, wow, we're all together in that thought. You know, it's funny how rumors can spread like that. Yeah, yeah. that's my album. That's all I got. I, I'm it? not gonna rant and rave anymore. It's it's it's. <laughs> I could go on for a very long time. Oh, right, right on, man. So, well, that, that was a good pick, man. I didn't expect that one to pop out. I was excited yeah. to hear about yeah. it on the ride over here. I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> yeah, we're doing that. But well, yeah, well, let's bump over to Chris Morris. And then, phew, we're going to time travel all the way to 1982, uh, May 14th. This band called The Clash released dun, dun, dun. Yeah, their fifth studio album, uh, <laughs> album with all album, the original album. members. This was the final <laughs> <laughs> this was the final album with all the original members uh, before the I, I believe the drummer left. And Chaos and did not know this. Yeah. I love this band and I, you know, one yeah. of those bands where I really dug the music. I loved the mm-hmm. their look and stuff. Never knew that this was the last of the original members. Yeah. Uh, but it was their fifth out of out of uh, six studio yeah. album so it's like the band Pretty lasted much. a while yeah yeah yeah, yeah they're, 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 they're good i mean they did well on the charts yeah, yeah. Well, this, we'll al- see. this album of course is <laughs> 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 we'll see, <laughs> we'll see this, this album is combat rock by the clash uh, the photo on the front cover is just the four guys on like a train tracks hanging out they look badass because they're yeah. punk uh, they play reggae kind of music too just that kind of poppy sound for this album um we had a few of those, like Rock the Casbah, with a bunch of weird sounds in it and uh-huh. everything. That photo, but I was talking about the uh, photo on the cover, was actually taken by a lady named Penny Smith in Thailand. It was taken. Doesn't that picture look like it would be something like England or America? Yeah, America. I think. It America. Was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was done in Thailand. Oh, I was shit. super surprised at that. Not a huge deal or anything. It's yeah, not yeah, yeah just interesting, head. right? They yeah. lied to me. <laughs> yeah, right. They have officially lied. <laughs> Um, yep, fifth studio. Um, the uh, main songs from this album. Uh, let's see. There's a whole. Let me show you. They went from 18 songs down to I believe 12 songs. I'll get into that oh. in a bit. But a uh, few of my favorites from this album are "Should I Stay or Should I Go," Ooh. "Rock the Casbah," <laughs> 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 "Yeah," <laughs> "Straight to Hell," 
Ooh, which is a yeah. slower jam. Not a lot of people listen to that one, but I love that song. Yeah, and Ghetto Defender. Ooh. Yeah. Or the Ghetto Defended. I call it Ghetto Defender because it sounds Defend- like a Defender. hero. <laughs> it sounds like a superhero, the Ghetto Defender. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Ghetto Defender. That's a great song. It's almost like a, almost like a spoken word, but there's a lot of singing in it from Joe Strummer. Uh, charted at number two in the UK, peaked at number seven in the US. This was the best selling album by the band, The Clash. This is their best selling. I honestly thought London Calling would be. I was just about to yeah. ask, better than London Calling? Yep. Well, maybe. It's so is, well, even in the UK, uh, London Calling, I figure, would have probably done better, no? Um, in the UK. I'm, I'm, not, sh- I'm not sure about the I don't diversity. Know. I don't it, know, though. I don't, like I said, I don't really know a whole lot. I, I actually I found this on uh, cassette tape at uh, Howell's. Uh, Books and music or Fat Cats. Yeah. Uh, record store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I found that and I found um, another Clash tape. I forgot. And I gave him to my buddy Alex Diaz. He's out in Hawaii. Yeah. Hawaii living, living it up. It up. <laughs> Alex, shout out, <laughs> brah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I listened to it, of course, before I gave it to him. So. Well, of course. Yeah, yeah, you know. It's like getting a movie for a friend. It's like, yeah. well, if I haven't seen it, like, let me watch it real quick. <laughs> it's like, does it, it can- still play? <laughs> <laughs> it sure does. I listened to it. <laughs> Doesn't play anymore. Uh, why, why is there semen on this DVD? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. It came like that. Yeah. I don't know. It, it came, came like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, you caught that too. Like, yeah. <laughs> We're so smart. No. Okay. Uh, the album went double platinum. Uh, yep, final album. Sorry, I'm just writing. I'm just going through all my notes real quick. Pro drummer. Uh, they were original. Well, chirp, for, chirp. Yeah, right. Chirp. Yeah. <laughs> Get them crickets going. Uh, the albums before, I think it was the two albums before this one. They were they they were being managed by Black Hill Enterprises. For this album, they decided to boop go back to their manager who was managing them before, a guy named Bernie Rhodes. And this guy really brought back kind of the Clash's attitude because you'll know from uh, if you listen to songs like White Riot or um, let me think here. I'm just trying to throw some words out real quick. Well, if you go from White Gun, you know, yeah, yeah. And then you listen to songs like uh, Radio Clash. Like this Mm -hmm. is a radio clash. Yeah, kind of has like a more hip hop reggae, like a dance kind of yeah, yeah. yeah. like hip hop reggae. Yeah, kind of dance. Um, so kind of dance reggae. They wanted to go back to that. Bernie Rhodes really brought that back with them, and uh, it it worked out because, like I said, this was one of their best selling ones. Originally, the album was supposed to be called Rap Patrol from Fort Bragg. And uh, Rap Patrol from Fort Bragg was beaten out, but uh, rumors are that you can find a bootleg version. Oh, because <laughs> originally, the ho- with the whole concept, the whole time they're working on this, it ended up being, um, it ended up being about eighteen songs throughout the entire album, and it was called Rap Patrol from Fort Bragg. What's the, oh what yours? Oh. He he knows. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was reading reading a quick note between us three. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna come back into it. Just do your thing. We're going. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> I was like, we might have to chop that because it sounds like shit, right? That's like, ah, I'm all scrambled. <laughs> Originally, the album was supposed to have 18 songs. They chopped it down to 12. Uh, it started out with 77 minutes wow. for the entire album. 77 minutes. They were lost. How? Like that's. They were considering doing a double LP, like uh, they did for London Calling and yeah. uh, what was this other one? It was Sen, Sendrick, uh, blah, 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 blah. I can't remember the name of this damn album, but I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Sandinista. Sandinista. Duh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sandinista and. London Calling, uh, London Calling was the double LP. Sandinista was a triple LP. Oh wow! Yeah. So with this album, after mixing by Mick Jones, the guitarist, uh, after he mixed it up, it was about seventy-seven minutes. And Joe Strummer, everybody else was kind of like, "Well, let's shorten this up. Let's keep this brief. You know, yeah. we don't we don't want to overstep anything." So what they did was they shortened all of the songs and didn't put any huge instrumentals into it. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's uh, what punk 
typically is. Yeah. Anyhow, but yeah, I mean, at least from that time. If yeah, you look that's what, that's just what was decided but upon. But still, to think of smart, what could have happened sure. to that yeah. genre if. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If they had they, I, I'm interested to maybe hear some something that they've yeah. done. You know, that's a little bit more than two, three minutes. And like I said, you can find, you may be able to find if you search online long enough. If you just search uh, "Rat Patrol" from Fort Bragg, the original name, there are bootlegs out there. There's like, yeah. there, it's like a mythos almost. Like they could be out there. Look for and it. And if you can find them in a in a store or something, it oh, probably shit. cost a little bit of money. No, too, yeah. Uh, it was know, never bootleg. it was never released as that. Right. So, but even then, a bootleg yeah. from that time period would probably yeah, yeah cost probably, a good penny. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just remembered the other album that I got by The Clash besides um, Combat Rock, and that was Give Them Enough Rope, which... Uh, uh, oh, that it, was on tape, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I had both of those cassette tapes that I got at yeah, the same saw time that from uh, Howl's uh, Books and Music, or Fat Cats. Fat Cats. <laughs> Again with Shout that. Shout out! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the... The whole list of Rat Patrol from Fort Bragg, it would be The Beautiful People Are Ugly too, Kill Time, and then now we're getting, those were not in, uh, not in Combat Rock. Okay. These one, the one I'm, ones I'm about to say here are in Combat Rock. Should I Stay or Should I Go? Rock the Casbah, Know Your Rights, Red Angel, Dragnet, Ghetto Defendant, Sean Flynn, Overpowered by Funk, and Straight to Hell. Boom. Very simple. Nice. And then everything out of that is, like I said, uh, The Beautiful People Are Ugly 2, Kill Time, Car Jamming, Inoculated City, Death Is A Star, Walk Evil Talk. <laughs> I love that last yeah, name. <laughs> walk, walk Evil Talk, Adam Tan, Inoculated City, Unedited Version, First Night Back in London, and Cool Confusion, which First Night in, Back in London and Cool Confusion actually... Uh, turned out to be B sides on their next album. Nice. Yeah, so they did some work. Like some work wasn't all faulty. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't all wasted. Uh, it was recorded at Electric Lady Studios, New York. Huh. Yep. Released by CB Records. Um, this band was splitting up around this time. Like I said, this was the final of the original cast. Joe uh, Strummer and the uh, I think it's the guitar player. They were definitely not. They never got along, really. They were yeah. constantly arguing over shit. Exactly, and this was kind of the final straw, because Mick yeah. Jones did all of yeah. the... The guitarist, he yeah. did all of the uh, mixing for it, and then everybody just kind of went behind him like, nah, bro, like we're going to chop all this up oh, wow. and do that, so... I know how I he, feel. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. you put in all that work and yeah. time, and you know you really believe in your shit, and then all of a sudden you got a whole bunch of guys like, mm, well, actually, you know. you know. It's like insulting intelligence in a yeah. way, too. It's stepping yeah. on toes, not really... You know, not really a cool thing. So, the final yeah. death rattle of the group. Yeah, and it's just is what it is. Uh, that's how it was going. Uh, Mick was already estranged from the group. Uh, Topper Hedden was in the throes of a hero or yeah heroin and cocaine addiction. So it it was just it was bad. Everybody was splitting up, and that's just how it went. But. Like, it was a great album. Yeah. Should I Stay or Should I Go is one of my very favorite yeah. songs. It's a great song. It's you know, uh, Rock the Casbah gets me in a great mood. Straight to Hell is just one of those great chili jams. And uh, I've never never been happier. As soon as I saw this, I, I got this one over at Blue Shark. Whoop, whoop. Yep. Blue Shark, shout out, Wood. <laughs> and, yeah, the minute I saw it, because that day even, I think it was me and you. We were both, me and Ian, we were both. Uh, we were hunting. Yeah, we were just hunting for stuff, and I was like, eh, you know. I'd or never... fishing, it is blue shark. <laughs> blue shark fishing. Yeah, oh, shark fishing. fishing. Hunting, whale hunting. Hunting Do you whale sharks? fish? <laughs> Do you fish for whale? Or Illegally, whale? yeah. What's uh, a shark? A shark. So do you. We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need a bigger boat for the blue shark. My favorite line in that movie. Womp, womp. <laughs> yeah, um. Yeah, I found it at Blue Shark, not expecting to see anything cool that day. Cause you were actually, we were searching for punk. Uh, we were searching for yeah. uh, Dead Boys and, you know, all television. The television, and, yeah. yeah. And you, we found The Clash. Yeah, we found The Clash, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> boom, took it. And I've, I've never been happier, of course. I can't wait to find more. And punk. I got my uh, London Calling not yeah. too long after. I'm waiting for you to do that pure find, dude. Uh-huh. He's been pushing. I love that the, yeah. the album cover and the story behind mm. it. What they were doing ever ever since, like he, what was it? Uh, 
He, I was looking in the regular, regular little tiny section off to the side. Don't, don't say it. Don't I'm, I'm not it. saying shit. I'm okay. not saying shit. No, 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 no. I was looking off into my little corner. Ian goes off into his corner. He comes by it. Instant jealousy. <laughs> he's, like, look, he's like, look at what I got. And I was like, sitting there with my dick in my hand, like, God damn it. <laughs> along, along with my unopened copy of... Um, oh, yeah. Um, don't Talking say it. Heads. Don't say it. No. Yeah, my, uh, my unopened copy of Talking Heads. Yeah, yeah, he hit a cash cow right there. Just bam, hit it. Both of them at the same time. Still yeah. unopened. Yeah, still unopened. Nice. Still it's like it's got, it's got it's got like a, I would have opened it. it's it's got like a, a cello, oh it's gone through my head so many times it's like it's got cellophane on cellophane yeah. kind of thing yeah, so like, um, yeah. it's like to make ah. you think twice about it uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 like ah new coaster <laughs> <laughs> in front of your friend who's a huge talking heads fan <laughs> uh, yeah it was just, it was a real it really was my pure find. It was my very favorite, and that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> now we can time travel to 1989. 1989. 1989. Yeah. Yep. The wall has Year been after taken down, born. you know. It's been taken down. The wall, you know. Uh, yeah. The, 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 wall. the wall. The wall. It's gone. That the wall. wall. That it's, wall. It's no yeah. longer there. The Berlin Wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that wall. Yeah. Right, right, right. I like this guy. <laughs> Pink Floyd's the wall. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm uh, talking about one of the most influential bands in my life, Nirvana. Oh, yeah. mm, and Bleach. Bleach being um, one that not a lot of people are very familiar with. You know, oh, yeah, everybody's heard like, Nevermind. Nevermind is the next familiar album, with the music, not the background, or not, and and just you know, speaking the, personally. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the song, the songs there are. Uh, not really that popular to even some of the Nirvana fans. I mean, you got the 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 deep Nirvana fans who have like you know Kurt Cobain's journal and have like all the box sets and demos and stuff, yeah. which I am not one of those. But I was listening to Nirvana back in the '90s when Kurt was when even it was still alive, when, it, when it was proper. Like, I mean, I was a kid, but I remember all that yeah. stuff, which is really cool, and I can hang on to that. You know, like I know in that's my treasure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but anyways, um, the uh, the thing I wanted to talk about was pretty much building up to Bleach. Okay. Which okay. I find interesting. I found it interesting because I was, was kind of yeah. doing a little research. And uh, uh, Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic met attending Aberdeen High School. But according to Cobain, the two never connected till they were uh, reacquainted at the Melvin's practice space after high school. So hey. they, they knew each other. But then really, like, you know. It's like, oh, like, I've hey, seen that guy yeah, in school. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know yeah. you. Well, you're your guy, The yeah. Melvins, <clears throat> which is a band from, like, the mid to late 80s. And, I mean, they did some 90s videos and stuff. And they were, like, you know, they were to the to the underground, like, music, you know. They were kind of, like, I mean, they, they were doing their thing. They were yeah. already kind of recognized as a good band. Um, they're they're kind of like a heavier metal. And you can definitely grasp from Nirvana's, you know, it's it's very inspiring, you know, to Kurt and and listening to their music. So while they're hanging out, um, Chris, uh, Chris and Kurt, they're uh, they're hanging out, and Kurt goes, you know, hey man, let's start a start a band, you know, and yeah, and Chris, uh, Chris hands or he hands Chris a uh, what do you call it a uh, demo, which uh, forgot the name of the demo, uh, but anyways, long story short, um, he wasn't really responsive never really listened to the demo oh, and then years later <laughs> listens to the demo and says hey let's start a let's start a band oh years. it's called yeah the it's uh it's a song called fecal matter <laughs> which, which is a good song hey. and, and is on the record um you know if, let's see here uh uh they they go through drummers they start off with their first drummer um bob mcfadden mm -hmm. and yeah. after after two months, or no, not even after one month, the band you know decimates. Just <laughs> yeah, was, no, that they, they, they went through like what <laughs> they seven could, to ten drummers. Yeah, they went through a few. Uh, <laughs> the second one was Aaron Burkhardt, um, and that's when yeah. the band begins to come up with names: Skid Row, Pen Cap, Chew, Bliss, uh, the Ed Fred, and I can definitely see in Bliss where Nirvana comes from. You know, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, the group finally sticks with Nirvana, which Kurt chose because he didn't want a raunchy punk name like the Angry Samoans, which, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can dig it, I guess, but I don't think it <laughs> would have awesome. made a difference. But Nirvana is <laughs> definitely you think of like, wow, that's a beautiful, you know, you think of the Buddhist, you know, the, you know, 
reaching mm. that stage of complete mental enlightenment. Yeah, enlightenment and yeah. intelligence. And it's like, and then you listen to ding, 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 yeah. ding. Like, That's why, like, when I was younger, before they taught us in school yeah. about uh, what Nirvana really is, I just only heard the name. I've never seen anybody wear a damn T-shirt no. because, like, yeah, people were lame in school. But uh, whenever I heard the name Nirvana and I've heard the music, I always thought it was, like, spelled, like, your nerves. Uh, like, yeah, gets on your nerves. Yeah. Like, Nirvana. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. what, that's, so that's where what, you, you kind of, like, put your own, like, lo- logical explanation Yeah, as a kid when, when you're a kid, what, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. like, they're wrestling. Mom and dad are wrestling. Because <laughs> 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 I was like, it's Nirvana. No way. It's, like, some wimpy... Fred, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like, what yeah, Fred, but, yeah. but, it, but it totally is. So it was like, the, it was cool. That was just definitely a realization. <laughs> well, after that, the third drummer is Dale Crover of the Melvins. So, uh, hey. anyways, what happens is, is um, they end up leaving uh, uh, Aaron Burkhardt when they move to like a couple spaces places in um in Washington State, one of which being Seattle, and um. And they go with uh, Dale Crover, who moves after uh, the first demo in early '88. Jeez. So they're 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 getting they're getting material worked on at this point. Um, and rec- uh, Dale Crover recommended um, a guy named Dave Foster, which lasted only a few months because he gets locked up, he gets arrested. And he goes to jail. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, that's cool. To, you know, you get to hear something like that actually going down. You at know? that point, Nirvana's just like, can we catch a damn break? So then Burkhard comes back, okay? Their second drummer comes back, is now the fifth, <laughs> I guess, in a way. <laughs> yeah. um, and it doesn't last long, actually. Uh, he ends up telling Kurt and Chris that he's uh, too hungover to attend practice, so they just oh, whoop, damn. kicked him out. Which, you know, that fast. They're just like, yeah, nope. You know, so they end up putting out an ad um, at a... Uh, in um, the Seattle music publication, uh, The Rocket, seeking a drummer. And they end up getting Chad Channing. And that is the drummer that's on the Bleach album cover. Yeah. yeah. And that's the drummer that's on most of the tracks. There are a few. Um, Love Buzz is um, probably, that came out in November 88 as a single. And that was, I believe... In early '88, Dale Crover from the Melvins. So you know, yeah. I'm 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 pretty sure I could be mistaken, but that that would only make sense because it was released in '88 when the album itself was released later on. Yeah, and that, that song is obviously on the album. It, it's yeah. safe to say that, yeah. uh, that several drummers appeared on this album. That wow. yeah, um, Blue, which is my favorite song off the record. It's the first song on mm-hmm. the album. Uh, it's the second single that comes out December '89. Right on. So. <clears throat> the last thing that I thought was an interesting fact was that, um, and a lot of people know this, if you're a Nirvana fan, you know, you're like, duh, the cost of the record was 30 hours of studio time for $606.17, <sighs> or equivalent to roughly estimated from when I read this, $1,200, or now maybe $2,000 for 30 hours of studio time. It's about, <sighs> that's the equivalency... So you're saying prices have uh, almost doubled? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is also, you're talking about a studio that's really sub-pop wasn't much of anything. Yeah, it was kind of just a room. Nirvana, really, I mean, they kind of made sub-pop and then end up going to EMI uh, on the last record, if I'm not mistaken. And then also Incesticide, which isn't a a real album. It's a, comp- a compilation of a few different songs and then past recordings that have been mastered and everything like that. But anyways, don't want to get too involved past this point because everybody and their mother, if I mention the next drummer after Mr. Channing, we will go on for three hours talking about I'm not about saying that. anything. Gee, I wonder who you could be he talking about. He is about. a legend, and he he is an excellent musician. But anyways, uh, <laughs> but... <coughs> Gentlemen and a scholar, and we'll yeah. leave it at that. Yes. That'll be all. <laughs> anyways, Jason Everman. Good day, sir. Jason Everman, who is pictured on, this, on the front cover of the what looks to be a negative... A negative photo. A photograph of uh-huh. the band. Uh, he looks like the other guitarist. He actually is the guy, Jason Everman, who supplied the band the six hundred uh-huh. and six dollars and seventeen cents. 
Oh, he gave him the money. He's the reason why the album got made. And oh, wow. it was Chris Novoselic's idea to put him in the front of the, on you the know, cover, on the cover of the of the <laughs> nice. album to make him feel like he's part of them. He's one of them. You yeah, know? And I, I kind of like that made me feel like kind of happy because I like to involve people in my projects, like everybody yeah. and anybody who I can. I mean, <laughs> you Absolutely. guys know this from uh, a warming welcome. But yeah. anyways, mm-hmm. uh, let's see here. That's uh, a little a little song. By, yeah, yeah, a little. By, it's, yours it's, truly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all of us. Yeah, here. big old compilation <laughs> song yeah. by the Fredericksburg Ensemble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got a couple. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, um, the the only other facts that I got from this uh, is the Billboard 200, and uh, it came in 89th place in America. I mean, it really didn't chart anything it became certified platinum over a 20-year period and it was yeah, 2009 still so it's though, like being they got top there. 200 yeah i mean that's still well, a the feat popularity i feel like it's the popularity of the band you know you get your second album yeah and it, it fucking charts and then if it if it takes you, it charts, if it, so. yeah if it takes you 200 years to get platinum hey you, you, you went platinum right <laughs> yeah but, but but 200 years it's like okay maybe it wasn't great but Definitely in 20 years going platinum, that's saying something. Oh, and, yeah. oh. and it's like, yeah, I've, I've listened to Nirvana many a time, but like Kyle's the one who showed me Bleach. He was like, this actually came out before, you know, yeah. all the uh, before the popular stuff. Yeah. And I listened to it and I was like, this is a lot of like, it kind of sounds like 80s metal backed off a bit but uh uh-huh, yeah that's what the melvins <laughs> are that's what the melvins are there was another band they um you know i cited a lot of my stuff from wikipedia but i also of course i did my own journaling here like uh i just the i've heard mud honey and I've, i don't really like see any correlation between them and nirvana except for the fact that they came out around the same time around the same place and they have a great and, name <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but other than that i really i listened to the melvins and i was like dude these guys are fucking badass yeah. you know i'm not you know i'm not used to hearing stuff that sounds like you know the early nirvana days you know not mm-hmm. too much there's some band, some bands out there but anyways um the good songs on the album um i didn't really write them all down and like like you said, listen to the fucking album. It's good. Uh, one yeah. of which that that you will, you know any Nirvana fan will know is um, about a girl. Uh, it's played uh, in the um, unplugged thing, uh, MTV unplugged. That song derives from that album, um, and it's played with you know it's played electric, clean, uh-huh. but it's good. And then uh, there's School, which I really dig, and um, you know, of course, Blue. <laughs> so I yeah. mean, there are a lot of good songs. Check it out. It's a great album. Um, that's that's pretty much it for me. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I love Nirvana, but if anything, check this album out. I found it. Uh, I actually found this record at um, what's Barnes and Noble. I don't know if it was Barnes and Noble. I, well, I saw it in a few places. I mean, shit, you could get it at at uh, Poser Store USA. Uh, what do you call it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hot topic. Uh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> I was about to be like, yeah, I mean, I've seen it. At, I've seen it at multiple places, and you could still find the record in any local shop. Um, I would think, but uh, you have to be looking but, for it. Yeah. Not everybody knows. You about have to find it, it purely, so. uh, it's pure and simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So it's like uh, yeah. uh, this record. I yeah, it was Barnes and Nobles was where I got it. Uh, you were with me actually. I think when I did purchase yep. that record so uh, i was looking at all the other ones like yeah, yeah. damn it man they got a lot of good albums here that, ended up that weren't that on lps before too, but, yeah you know it's, it's a great record yeah. like i said people listening hell yeah nirvana, nirvana. bleach yeah check it out uh you it. just look for the cover it's a bunch of guys rocking out on their instruments and it's black and, and, it's black and it's white metal. just negative version it looks so cool yeah um and i guess that that's the end of our show that's our three albums that we have uh i'm trying to think of a question to ask the folks at home uh, we had such a good response last time with the movies. I loved that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been tinkering around in my head. And I'm thinking. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are: Should we ask what? Who? Uh, in your opinion, what is a band's f- best first album? What's the best first album by a band? One that was like either well received or it's like you like you think is the best. I don't so you're know. talking about freshman year. Yeah, because sophomore year is usually when bands start to to show a little bit, develop the, like the good yeah. stuff. Yeah, but, but I'd I can, say, but I'd say, uh, first album. That's when they're off the streets. I would say, like uh, some of the newer bands um, that have come out within the past fifteen years, like uh, you know maybe Jet. Or, oh you know, yeah, like the, they, they come out. And they wonderful just push first album. You, you actually make a good point. The the 
I'd go as far as say the last twenty years. Yeah, a freshman album. Really, I wanted to say that, but I was like, well, that's not too current, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I but, twenty yeah. years isn't really that current. I guess yeah, you're right with fifteen, and even you could go even lower than that with ten. ten. Where a freshman, I don't know. Al- we have, uh, if we go for twenty, that's nineteen ninety six. A freshman yeah, album, that's... though. Okay, uh, let me narrow it down <laughs> even further. We're older in, than we think. <laughs> in the two thousands, a mm. freshman album makes more of a. I guess a bigger draw than what the sophomore album did yeah. for most bands back in the day. And really, the sophomore album could be the end. That's when you drop out of high school. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So yeah, you drop out of the yeah, game. Yeah, so I would. <laughs> a, a sophomore album back in the day made, made more sense for more listeners because it's when they're gaining popularity, things are starting to improve and stuff like that. So a second album. I mean, Cage the Elephant, uh, first album. Their <laughs> first album rocked. Yeah. Set, like the rest of them just dropped. I loved them, but no, yeah, not yeah, a lot of other I people did. <laughs> I mean, if I we're were if we're speaking purely in like popularity Somewhere. and or in sales or you know that kind of thing, because <clears throat> anybody can sit there who's an actual true fan of an artist say that, well, you got to listen to their first album. You know, it's one of those. Uh, it's. Uh, I always say that. Like, you got to hear yeah. the first one. <laughs> right, right. Because you want them to experience them when they first came out. Mm-hmm. It's the sophomore album that really shows the group who they are. They're more defined. They're you know, it, it's it, you get all, all the jitters out of being in that first time studio experience, and you finally get them settling into being them. Okay. So, uh, in my experience, a lot of the freshman albums seem or sound slightly different than the albums that come after. Mm-hmm. You, okay. you know, you can, you can kind of hear uh, a similarity from the second album on, whereas the first one's like, let me just toss it out there to s- test the waters kind of yeah. thing. Throw the dick out into space and see what planet it hits. Yeah, you use that reference yeah. earlier. Well, I would definitely. I love using that <laughs> reference. It's I, my favorite. I would like to hear some uh, some band controversies. Some uh, hey. you know, what's what's up with some of that? What people that may find con- interesting. Actually, that would bleed into our next episode. <laughs> controversies. Yeah. What's controversies. your favorite music controversy? Yeah. yeah. You know, because and next I mean, that's, week, that's a very wide one. next week is our ninth episode. Uh, number, number nine, nine number, number nine, nine, number nine. It's uh, Beatles Mania up in here. If All you four of us are going to do, <laughs> we're each going to do a Beatles album. One after 909 is yep. 10. And that's going to be after that one. Yeah, okay. gonna, every Each one of us, all four of us are going to be at the table. Each one of us is doing a Beatles album. It's going to be Beatlemania up in here. There's going to be four of us too. Yeah. So. And I think Beatles. The controversy will be tossed around in that yeah. episode. <laughs> I, I do like that idea. Are you guys down with that? I Sounds like controversy. Let's, uh, controversy. Let's, let's, uh, yes. let's make it in a form of a question or statement to yeah. get some okay. people, you know. I, I like all of our listeners. I think that they're awesome. Alrighty, <laughs> listeners. I'm going to ask you a quick question, guys, and I want to hear some answers <laughs> on Facebook or YouTube. What do you think is the most convincing musician conspiracy theory that could go from... The Walrus is Paul. <laughs> to oh, no, no, don't give maybe, nothing away. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. just saying, like, playing records backwards, maybe the demons come out. Yeah, anything like that, just uh, type them in, let us know, because I, I only know of a few. Maybe there's some that I don't even know about. Who killed Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> anything like that. <laughs> we can definitely talk more about it and just throw in some details. But that's the end of our show. Thank you for listening to Pure Finds. We're closed. Now listen to awesome outro music.